Yo, I'm Bob, into Marvel, happen to be totally blind since birth, talking about X-Men 97, Season 1, Episode 4, and this one has two titles, Matendo and Life Death Part 1. This one premiered on April 3rd in 2024, I'm filming this the day after, on April 4th. I've seen this one four times because, well, I mean, there's just so much to try and glean from it. So... There are spoilers ahead. If you haven't watched the episode yet, I'd advise you to do that or you're going to get spoiled. That being said, jumping right in and you were warned. Right off the bat, I wanted to call this uh, X-Men Season 6, the 80th episode of the show overall because it really does feel like we're watching a continuation from X-Men the Animated Series. Like I said in previous videos, it really feels like you know we've come home in terms of getting to see more of this continuity. Um, I like that this episode focused on Jubilee as well as Storm. So we got uh, two stories in one episode. Reminded me of the way that you used to see Nicktoons on Nickelodeon. You know, you get two 15-minute dog episodes or Rugrats episodes uh, in in a half hour. I'm, but this is X-Men, you know. But it, it kind of adds to that 90s feel of TV shows. Not that Fox Kids ever did that with, with X-Men. But I like that we got more than one story in this episode. Something I failed to mention in the previous uh, episode reviews. Whenever each episode begins and we get the previously on X-Men, you have a character uh, other than, uh, you know, Cyclops voicing the, uh, the previously on. Uh, and it's usually a character that the episode is spotlighting. Like at the beginning of episode two's recap, you get Matthew Watterson voicing Magneto for the previously on. At the beginning of episode three, you get Jennifer Hale who voices Jean and Madeline doing the previously. And at the beginning of episode four here, you get Holly Chow who voices Jubilee uh, doing the previously on. Now, Microsoft Copilot pronounces her last name Chow. I cannot find any interviews in which she pronounces her last name. So, Microsoft Copilot, if you got that uh, pronunciation mispronounced, you're going to have to listen to Mojo narrating a very, very long audiobook. That will be your punishment for mispronouncing Holly's last name. Um, but yeah, I like the two uh, stories that we get here. I mean, the first one is you know, basically Jubilee and Sunspot, they get sucked into a video game. But I really liked it. There was a clip released the day before the episode premiered and it was just called Arcade. So, I mean, I didn't watch the clip, but when my screen reader narrated that clip, the title of the clip out loud, I thought, oh, we're gonna get Arcade, the character Arcade in animation, but no. And the, the big bad of this short, is of course Mojo and I love that we get to see him again because in the original animated series Mojo is only in two episodes. I mean he's in Mojo Vision and Longshot and that's it so I like that he's still trying to come up with ways to boost his ratings and uh, make himself uh, the biggest exec in all dimensions. So him somehow getting that Motendo I love that, you know, for Mojo. Into Jubilee's room, that's got to be an interesting story in itself. And, I mean, it's her birthday. Eric's not wanting her to go to the arcade. And she's understandably upset. Everybody else is really wanting her to have a good 18th birthday. You know, you got Beast and Wolverine and Rogue um, sticking up for Jubilee. But Eric's not having any of that. So she's kind of in her room with uh, Sunspot. And, uh, yeah, they automatically get uh, sucked into that video game. It just sounds really painful, according to the audio description track, where you've got the wires kind of shooting out of the Motendo. And they go into Jubilee's mouth and, I think, her nose. Ow! So, the arcade game itself. Uh, I remember the X-Men arcade game at... Uh, well, I'm not sure if it was at an Aladdin's castle in Nashville when I was in like the fourth grade in, um, you know, in the, in the summer of, uh, I think it was 94. Uh, but I wonder if a lot of that stuff in, in the episode here is possibly callbacks to the video game. I do remember, you know, watching a playthrough of this and I think Magneto was the final boss and it's kind of cool that he's the final boss here. I mostly stuck with X-Men Children of the Atom 
and uh, X Men versus Street Fighter. I think X Men versus Street Fighter was at the arcades back in the day. I mostly remember Children of the Atom, though. And uh, so you know you've got Jubilee and Sunspot trying to survive Sentinels. They're trying to survive the Savage Land. And I love the big Mojo reveal. And uh, I think the voice actor for Mojo, I do believe his name is David Arrigo Jr. Um, he does a great job um, bringing the, uh, the original voice uh, to life, as well as providing a bit of his own flavor to the character. Mojo is still that shrill, um, ill-tempered exec who's trying to uh, make a name for himself. And in this case, he's trying to get everybody to buy the Matendo. And, uh, you know, he, he's, he's, uh, he's wanting Jubilee to be the big star here. I really liked seeing this guy again. I don't think we saw enough of him in the original animated series. Um, now, if we saw him in, like, you know, every other episode, I think that would be a bit much. But I, I think Mojo's an interesting character. And I like seeing Spinal. Spinal? I'm thinking of uh, Killer Instinct. I'm sorry, Spiral. <laughs> <laughs> voiced by Abby Trot, I do believe. And I like how she she gives Spiral this perpetually exasperated voice, that tone that we hear uh, in the original animated series. Spiral does not want to work for this guy. She's got to. She knows what she's supposed to do. Uh, she seems like she's always having the worst day ever, having to listen to Mojo just shriek at her. Um and so you've got her in the episode just a little bit. I love that. Uh, she was an interesting character in the original animated series. I like the final battle, uh, seemingly final battle, the boss fight taking place on Asteroid M. Uh, we're, we're, you know, reminded of the uh, episode Sanctuary from the original series. We also get to go to pre- mutant nation genosha back when it was slave island and we get we get a call back to slave island from season one there i wonder if those guards look the same in uh, in the video game as um, jubilee and sunspot are going after them going up against them um, so when magneto is hiding in his uh, force field there i think that's exactly what he does at the end of Children of the Atom, I think he can summon that force field at will. And then he throws a bunch of, uh, I, I guess it's a bunch of metal at you in that video game. Um, but I'm, I'm not really sure because there are no audio description tracks to Children of the Atom. I, I'm, I'm thinking you fight him at the end of uh, the X-Men video arcade game as well. Uh, I'm also reminded of the Super Nintendo game my brother had when I was a kid. You could play as different X-Men. Was it, um, I can't remember what it was called, X-Men Apocalypse, Rise of Apocalypse, something to do with Apocalypse. Um, I should have looked that up before I did this uh, episode review. But yeah, this was a really wacky uh, episode, and I like how you get to hear Allison Court back as, I think the character's name is Absissa, Absissa, and she's an older Jubilee. And listening to Allison and Holly both voicing a Jubilee, um, it's crazy how similar they sound. Um, I, I really like these two teaming up at the end when they're, they take on Mojo as a giant. Uh, so that's the true final boss. And they do this power-up attack where they combine their, their energies and they kind of blast him with this big orb of firework energy according to the audio description track. So to me, it's like uh, a really awesome assist attack from uh, X-Men versus Street Fighter or one of the Marvel versus Capcom games where you have two characters finishing off off one character with a big powerful attack so i love how that ended and then of course you have um you got sunspot and jubilee uh happy to be out of there and then sparks are literally flying as uh, that little uh, bit of the episode comes to an end uh i give that i would say a 10 out of 10 by itself and i hope we're not done with the mojo verse i would love to see more of allison court as uh, that version of jubilee i don't know if they're gonna do stuff with her because i do believe she had more stuff to do in the comics so maybe we're not done with this alternate jubilee i loved hearing allison back um, when it comes to Holly voicing Jubilee and, and Allison, I think for me that they both tie. It sounded like Jubilee in stereo to me. Um, 
I think Holly does a fantastic job creating, uh, you know, recreating that voice as well as, you know, adding some originality to it. Um, you know, when she's voicing Jubilee, it feels like, you know, going back to the 90s for me. I'm, I couldn't be happier with what she's doing with Jubilee. Also, nice work by Guy Agostini as Sunspot. So, Life, Death, Part 1. Uh, I was really looking forward to seeing more of Storm and Forge in this episode. I mean, it's not a lot, but uh, I like that he's making that uh, that bison chili. And I also like the revelation that we got, you know, as, as he is doing his best to help her reacquire her powers because you know as i said in other videos i've read a long time ago that he was responsible for building uh the the technology to sap mutant powers and i like that they are going with this in terms of uh, x-men 97 so you know getting to see a kind of adaptation of that is something i've been wanting for a long time and i'm really glad that they decided to go with that i also like that uh, we get a call back to slave island and the cure uh, from season one of the the original animated series because dr adler might have designed those uh those collars that were used um you know on the island and he was a scientist from scotland as forge mentions but forge was the one you know originally who had come up with this idea and you have adler kind of using what forge uh had originally designed to go and build the collars so really cool that you know everything is is kind of connecting here i like how forge describes inventing you know, being able to access dormant parts of the, the human brain, you know, for his mutant power, he kind of says, well, this is a, an, a, an, an a Rubik's Cube on autopilot. And uh, it's a really interesting way to describe his powers. And when Storm tells him, you know, um, I'm sorry about your, your cybernetic arm, but it's amazing that you were able to fix yourself. I'm paraphrasing, of course. I like how he says, oh, I'm not broken. I, I just uh, managed to adapt and get a bit creative. And it's kind of how I feel about how I have to deal with my disability. I don't really consider myself to be broken. It's more like you have to adapt and you have to come up with creative ways of doing things. It may take a heck of a long time to figure it out for me because I don't have Forge's crazy, um, insanely intelligent mutant brain. But I mean, you know, you kind of get this. I really like that part of the episode where he's describing how uh, his power works. And when Storm finds out that Forge is ultimately responsible for her losing her power, she is understandably upset. She feels betrayed. Uh, Forge ha has feelings for her, and he all of a sudden admits this uh, toward the end of the episode. And that was really interesting. Uh, and then she kind of goes out uh, on horseback. It's kind of cool seeing her on horseback because we did see her back in uh, Savage Land, Strange Heart, Savage Land, Savage Heart, Part 1 and 2, Riding Horse. So here she is doing it again. And all of a sudden, she's back in Forge's house. That was really freaky. So when we see this owl-like entity at the end of the episode, now my first thought was, oh, wow, this is, this is Shadow King because this thing feeds on uh, negative energy. So it's, it's probably Shadow King. I had since then looked up a character called the adversary because that's what this thing calls itself. And this is another villain in X-Men comics. So, I mean, it could be the Shadow King, but I wonder if this is a villain that we haven't seen yet, uh, adapted to animation because the adversary is a demon, uh, unto himself. He's a very powerful demon and uh, he's got a lot to do in the comics. So, I guess this is probably who this entity is at the end. Now, if it's the Shadow King, that's awesome too, because we only really got to see him in two appearances in the original animated series. He was in um, Whatever It Takes and Xavier Remembers, but I think this is the actual adversary because that's uh, who this thing announces himself as. It's really cool that the character is voiced by Allison Seeley Smith, but they just do a lot of voice distortion to that. Uh, voice of hers there at the end of the episode. Um, so I don't know what we're going to see next. I'm not sure how Storm is going to get out of this as well as Forge. I don't even know if this is actually Forge. I, I'm willing to bet that it is because 
uh, I think Forge has had dealings with this demon, or he's had to go up against it in the comics. So it it would make sense that this thing was actually Forge. Um, or Forge was actually Forge, I'm sorry. Um, I give this part of the episode an 11 out of 10. I really do like that we got two uh, different tales in this episode. I hope that we, we stick with one story, but this kind of felt like... You know, an A story and a B story. It's great that we got to spend some time with Jubilee and uh, Sunspot, but that we also got more regarding Storm and uh, the loss of her powers. Even though Forge uh, does his best to to build that machine in order in order to get her powers back, um, <clears throat> that doesn't happen for her, and she is still uh, struggling to to do without her powers. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure how they're going to get out of this. I really hope I'm not missing anything in terms of, uh, what I'd enjoyed from this episode. So interesting that, uh, back during the arcade portion of the episode, when Magneto goes down, uh, as final boss, you kind of hear that echoing, gah, 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 like you'd hear in a street fighter game. Or, uh, you know, if you played the old Ninja Turtles arcade when Shredder is taken out at the end of that game, he's like, oh, 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 oh. so it's kind of like this big echoing scream as the as the big bad uh, falls over or disappears into the nothingness, into the ether. So I like that they did that with Magneto as he goes down. As for Mojo being taken out, yeah, he's probably going to be fine. I would like to see Spiral kind of have to uh, do things uh, without Mojo for a little bit. I kind of want to see her take over. I don't know if that's going to happen. He's I don't know if his brain is scrambled eggs for a bit. Maybe it is. <laughs> I'm not sure. I think he got his uh, his his spineless butt handed to him there. But hopefully we'll we'll see him again at some point. Like I said, I'd love to see more of uh, this alternate Jubilee. See what she's up to. Hopefully she survived. So the next episode is going to be Remember It. And I I don't know what that is in reference to we do know that in the animated series the original animated series uh, sometimes gambit would say the name is gambit remember it um cable said that to apocalypse remember it the name's cable uh so you never know um we got a week until the next episode i don't know if we're going to be seeing more of storm i wonder if they're going to make us wait two weeks uh, to see what in the heck happens next with storm uh, who the heck knows at this point? Uh, we, we are in uncharted territory, but I loved uh, both parts of this episode, and uh, I can't wait to see more of this show. Uh, we know we're getting a season two. I really hope that they uh, green light this for a third season because I'm having a blast with this thing so far. Uh, so until next time, true believers, I will hear you then. Something in the middle, but